Hey everyone and welcome to Almost Cancelled. I am Peter, that is Connor, and this is our weekly TV news show. Even though we didn't have one last week, although we d we actually planned on doing it slightly late, and then we had to push it back again, and it got to the point where it just made more sense to push it back to when we normally record it and just do a double batch. So I have two full weeks of news, <laughs> ready to go. Usually when it's a case of, oh well we missed a week, Pete does check both weeks, but is a a little bit stricter. But because we had the full week already, it's it's it yeah, might it was, be neater than usual. It was prepared. The news was prepared for last week, so I actually have it as two separate sets. So I'm going to try and do my best to keep the format, uh, switching between these two folders of tabs. But you know, if, if it's not perfect, uh, he's, he's guaranteed to miss something. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, we're going to have it too. But yeah, so this is our TV news show. We talk about uh, renewals, cancellations, pilot orders, series orders, blah, 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 blah. All the usual things that come along with TV news. Uh, generally, chat about TV going-ons and whatnot. Yes, uh, TV news. Let's, uh, let's, let's uh, talk about things. So, uh, first up, I'm going to start with some of last week's stuff. Uh, Ray Donovan has been cancelled by Showtime after its seventh season. Uh, so, they didn't know it was going to be their final season. It's already done and they've been cancelled so there's no kind of you know eighth and final season it wasn't their seventh and final season it's just it got cancelled after seven seasons i wonder if they were like internally maybe had some suspicions and plan you know because you'll, you'll get some shows like when they get to five plus seasons they'll end every season safely just because they're like well maybe maybe mm -hmm. um, or, or maybe they didn't and it's gonna have no ending and it's gonna be shit yeah so that's uh it's, it's sad for people who who are fans of the show uh especially i mean who knows what the ending's like uh if you know if it does it have a cliffhanger <laughs> if it has a cliffhanger they're going to be really pissed or yeah. is or does it serve uh well because I, I think the finale uh which aired yeah the finale of the last seven season aired on january 19th so this is just a few weeks after you know time of this okay. news coming out so just a few weeks after the finale I, aired i didn't see a lot of people reacting online like maybe i'm just not in the right circles but i didn't see personally a lot of people being really upset that they didn't get a proper ending yeah so maybe it works well for what it what it did uh yeah. and that's just the end of the show now so that is what it is uh next up uh disney disney plus specifically have kind of given us some loose timings for some shows coming up this happened last week uh the mandalorian second season is going to come uh, back in october so you're going to see that uh, returning then but we also got some months for some marvel shows that are coming this year uh coming in august is falcon and the winter soldier so that's going to be the first of the marvel disney plus shows and then one division is coming in december and those are both going to be six episodes each. Uh, so it's going to be very little downtime between those three shows. No, they're, they're literally going to run into each other, I believe, uh, more or less. Oh, I mean, I was looking; there might be a week or so yeah. between each one, maybe. Uh, so it basically means once uh, Falcon Winter Soldier starts, you've got something big each week from either Marvel or Star Wars uh, until a few Can weeks we into the year. year. Um, and we know Loki's coming next year so it's entirely possible that might even be like in february and come right after yeah one division i'm pretty sure they're filming that now yeah. right because there was the uh, teaser sort of trailer reel that they did at the super bowl which had a few clips from some of these marvel shows uh one division definitely looked kind of quirky uh to say the least it looked different i'll give it that um so no yeah. uh, so those are on the way and we'll we'll see how those pan out uh so that's the thing uh somehow some shows just always get bad news why the last man has lost its leading uh his lead actor uh the yorick <laughs> has is no longer there barry cohen who was going to be in it has had to leave and presumably this is probably because they kept pushing it back that he eventually schedule eventually just busied up yeah, yeah. so uh, back so to never going to happen <laughs> uh they've got f uh we've seen five or six scripts uh one of the executives have said so they've got scripts now at the very least There's... i mean it's it's more than i would have believed like a year ago <laughs> maybe we'll see this someday maybe we won't um and so... even if we do will it just disappoint us like lock and key um, i mean i'm more hopeful of this than i was lock and key but sure there's, there's a possibility I, I just mean there's a parallel isn't there you know this long gestating adaptation of a comic yeah, very different premises, though. So, 
Oh, sure. Pre- I'm not, not comparing the premise, just the idea of, you know, they, they both, you know, for a long time, you're like, oh, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. And then all of a sudden there's news. And, you know, obviously Lonky did actually eventually happen. And it was fine. They can't kidify this one, at least, though. This is definitely... You would hope, yeah. It's definitely more mature. I mean, hell, part of the plot involves a bunch of uh, women cutting off one of their boobs to sort of yeah. out of solidarity or whatever. Uh, as well as a Reddit, but I, I remember that being a thing. Uh, it's solidarity or whatever. Yes. Uh, well, they're kind of extremists, if I remember right. Like, it was kind of this, like, they're this extreme faction uh, yeah. that sort of come up after the uh, the male apocalypse. Anyway, uh, next up, Superman and Lois have cast two young actors to play the sons, uh, the, the, the super sons, if you will, um, in the show. So... Jordan Elsass and Alexander Garfin are going to star on the show. Uh, and just looking at their images here, they look like like 14 and 12 uh, for my, sure. my glance here, give or take. So that's interesting. So here's here's the descriptions they've got of the characters here, which is, is curious. Because uh, again, in the comic books, like they have one son named John Kent. So uh, Elsass uh, is going to play... Uh, Jonathan. So he's John Kent. Yeah. Uh, he's the modest and kind-hearted with the aw shucks attitude that somehow doesn't seem dated. Uh, whereas Garfin's playing a character called Jordan. So Jordan Kent is wildly intelligent but has uh, uh, mercurial temperament and social anxiety limits his interactions with people and consequently Jordan prefers to spend most of his free time alone playing video games. Okay. Okay. Um, I feel like I read something that that you know one of them was like sport. You know, like like you know the the I think it was John was like a bit sporty and stuff. That would that would jive with what they said. Yeah. So that that made me assume that okay, so the the awkward one's definitely the one getting powers, and 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 the other one's gonna be jealous. Yeah, I imagine they'll eventually both have powers, but eventually, yeah, yeah. probably. Unless they do a thing where they're, 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 they're... Because they're not twins, actually, so now they wouldn't be. I was going to say, maybe if they were twins, they'd do a thing where one's purely human <laughs> and one's purely Kryptonian. Is like a weird <laughs> thing. Sure, sure. Uh, so yeah, obviously Crisis has aged them up, so they've had these kids now for, you know, years and oh, years. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, so they can be at least, te- you know, high school aged. Just about. So, okay. Fair enough. Uh, so that's the thing. Um, next up, uh, Tom Hiddleston. Uh, speaking of Loki, actually, uh, he's going to be the male lead in a show called White Stark, uh, formerly known as Spadehead, which we did bring up before, and I vaguely remember it. Uh, so this is a Netflix political thriller series about the paradox of truth in a post-truth world. Uh, the British drama series comes from Eleven, the company behind uh, Sex Education, which obviously has been a relative success for Netflix. So yeah. that is coming. Um, so yeah, anyway, start, uh, when James Cooper, played by Hilson, is selected to run uh, for a seat in Parliament, Asher Milan is set to vet him for prime time. But she quickly uncovers potentially damaging secrets buried deep in James's past. Secrets that will threaten to blow everything apart. His career, his marriage, even the powerful people backing his campaign. So, 10 episode show, for the record. That's something I could enjoy. Yeah. yeah. Nothing I'm particularly excited about. Uh, it, it reminds me, there's like a, a 15 minute segment on one episode of The Thick of It in one of the specials that is basically that. Uh, and I, I want to see that expanded into 10 episodes, sure. Uh, next up, apparently HBO Max wanting to pull in the subs, wanting to get people on board and well, excited. They for us now. Well, if I was to say to you, what do you think like, one of the biggest cards they could play if they could pull it off would be? I don't know. Warner has such a varied library that it depends on you know who you ask would give you a very different answer. I think based this more less in what you like or think is important and more what the in discussion in the past has been about certain rights going back to Warner and how much money was paid for rights to a certain thing before HBO Max. I'll be honest, I'm completely blanking, but I, I'm sure as soon as you tell me, it's going to come right back. 
Friends. Oh. Oh. Right. So, I did not see this new story at all. So, yes, apparently they are developing and getting close to a deal to do an unscripted reunion special, which isn't the most exciting version of a reunion, admittedly, because it's just... It's just the cast. It's just the around. cast, yeah. But uh, they're doing this to help launch HBO Max, uh, which, you know, obviously Friends is going to be there, and it'll be there forever, as, as long as HBO Max doesn't die because it becomes, you know, unfeasible at some point, which I don't think it will be because Warner Bros. are huge. Like, it'll always be there because they will never, they'll never give it away again. Why would they? <laughs> it's their service. Yeah, well, that would be stupid. Um, well, that said, though, if you get into a conversation, I mean, I'll be talking to Matt about this tomorrow, about uh, WWE Network and how that seems to be starting to pivot in the other direction because they're not making as much money with their own service as they thought they could, so they're looking at actually selling off some of their events again. So, How about you save this bullshit for tomorrow? Uh, uh, preferably after I'm done with the show because we've got a shitload of news and I would like to get some sleep tomorrow night. I'm making no promises. I'm making no promises. Okay, well, we'll see. So, yeah, apparently uh, the six cast members uh, have reached an agreement uh, in principle with series producer Warner Brothers, and it would be an hour-long special with all six stars each been paid in the three to four million dollar range for appearing in the special. So that's how much it costs to get those six people together. It's three to four million dollars each. I mean, adjusted for inflation, I'm sure that's about on par. I feel, well, yeah, because they were been paid over a million per episode by the time Friends is finished. I I have to wonder that if they ever did something with them getting back together, it'd have to be a movie now with how much they'd have to pay them. Yeah, I think they would. Because paying six people like four million per episode, even for a ten episode season, gets really pricey. Yeah, absolutely. And this is one of those things where they're probably using this as a loss leader, right? You know, they're oh, like, sure. we'll pay whatever they want just so we can go, hey, look, friends new thing come subscribe to us day one this is where you get it yeah and don't get me wrong they'd have to pay them more if it was a movie but it wouldn't be as much as a full season they'd have to, you know it would be like they'd all get 10 million each for a movie say give it or, i'm just you know sure. it could be anything but like i'm saying 10 million and but i feel like a movie did make a lot of money whereas a tv show like because i feel like a friends movie with the cast see if they did like a friends movie with those six cast members in it i feel like it would probably do very well you release that theatrically. Let's be honest. You might be looking at a billion dollar movie. You might. It may be the first billion dollar comedy. It, it genuinely might. I don't think we've not had a billion dollar comedy yet. I mean, not like a pure comedy. Like, I don't think so. No, nah, we haven't. No, nah, they've all been blockbusters. I, I, or... I, I want to kind of just see what the billion dollar movies are now, but. Yeah, you know, just just in case. Uh, oh, this 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 site's terrible. Never mind. There's forty six movies that have made a billion dollars now. Well, it's happening like multiple times a year at this point. I, I didn't realize it was at quite that many, though. To be honest with you, I'm surprised. So anyway, nice... Wikipedia's got me covered. Does something like Minions count? Nah, it's a kids movie. I went. I went count that. If we're not counting that and other kids' movies of the kind, then uh, absolutely not. Okay. All right, so I'm going to switch to this week's stuff then before I go to new shows. I'll try and keep at least some semblance of a uh, regular format here. Uh, so we got a renewal this week for Avenue 5, uh, the new comedy on HBO. Yeah, I haven't started watching it yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the uh, the Iannucci one that uh, stars uh, Hugh Laurie uh, on the uh, spaceship, I believe, uh, that they're on. Um, it looks like a blast. I, I, and I'm hearing good things, uh, especially from other fans of Iannucci's other works. So I suspect I will enjoy it greatly. And um, I will binge it at some point, even though I just started watching Always Sunny again today for some reason. From the start? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that sounds so positive. But yes, yeah, so that's getting. I don't getting... know why I chose to do that, but I just thought, ah, screw it. Yeah, that's getting a season two, so happy days. Uh, speaking of renewals, uh, Bosch from Amazon, which I know some people love, has got a seventh and final season. So that that is getting its final, you know, run, its final season where they know it's the end. 
So that is cool. And hopefully that's this becomes a trend from Amazon, much like it has been with Netflix, where they'll do these final seasons. At least for anything that's over two seasons. Like, I've seen them cancel a few things after one or two seasons, but I feel like once it gets to the third one, they always make a point of saying, and final, so that you know it's the last one going in. They do. I feel like they learned from a lot of backlash, though, that they got from just cancelling things, that, mm-hmm. that they kind of made a point of doing this. And the, the, the first big one was... Uh... Oh god, that like international show where you know Sensei. They, they all... Sensei, thank you. Yeah, and and that got such a a bad reaction that from then on they were kind of a bit more aware. I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then we have Afterlife. Speaking of Netflix, got a premiere date uh, for the second season. This is the Ricky Gervais comedy. Uh, season two is coming on April twenty fourth. So uh, this is a six episode season that's coming. So that's cool. I've heard good things about this. Uh, a lot of people like it. So. I'm sure mm-hmm. there are many people looking forward to the second season. Yep. Uh, Sci-Fi have put a premiere date for a 10-episode live-action adaptation of a, of a comic from a vault comic. It's called Vagrant Queen, and that is going to premiere on March 27th. Uh, so, there you go. Another comic book TV show. of Something I've, admittedly I've never heard of. Yeah, I, I couldn't tell you what it is. I'll be honest, like, even Vault Comics as a publisher, I think I've heard of them, but like... Only I've vague. read a couple of things from Vault, I'm pretty sure. Only vaguely. Like, it's not something that... They're pretty small, comparatively. Yeah. Uh, and then next up, also from Netflix, is a little teaser video that came out for today, of all days. Because Valentine's Day, at the time of recording. And they put out a little teaser for Stranger Things 4. They did. I literally stopped at work and just watched <laughs> it on my phone. Because I was like, oh, what's this now? Yeah. My, honestly, my only complaint about this little video is that it didn't go to the title screen at the end with the music because it felt like it should have done it just kind of fades to black and it's the end and i'm like no no no, cut to the you know it, yeah, yeah have the title zoom on the screen and do the music the damn usual. it yeah. but anyway uh so it's you know so i will say do, before do I, talk about what's in it? yeah before i think we can but i'll just say before i say this if you've not watched the previous seasons and you don't want them spoiled uh or you you know you don't know what happened at the end of season three and uh, this statement will kind of spoil something from the end of season three but you know if you care about the show you probably watched it already if you haven't then i'm warning you so i mean this will be like a 10 second description so i'm starting now it shows that hopper's alive hopper's in russia uh working away so you got that yeah the only funniest thing for me is that like it was oh, just in the last day or two where there was like cast lists and announcements kind of being made mm-hmm. of like oh these are the people coming back for this season and you know, David Harbour wasn't on the list, and people were like, "Oh my God, he's not in it." They've just confirmed that he's not coming back. And then, like a day later, yeah. there was this, and I, I just thought that was very funny. Yeah, they've just started shooting, which eh, they may still make a release for Christmas. I don't think it's happening this year. I'm sorry. I think I think it'll be winter. If it's not Christmas, I think it'll be January, or February. That seems maybe. I just I I'll be surprised if we get a season this year. Okay, but I mean, I don't, I don't see why it's uh, any less... I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't, but I don't necessarily think it's surprising if we do. Uh, this is early enough in the year that, yeah, they could they could have this done shooting for, like, April and... No, they could. I'm not saying it's, like, a physical impossibility. I just, I'll be surprised. So, uh, so yeah, Stranger Things 4 got a teaser, which is cool. Um, season 3, I think, was its best season, and I am mm-hmm. pumped for season 4. Uh, next up, so here's something that kind of was ending and now might not be ending because Netflix have just changed their mind. So the upcoming fifth season of Lucifer was announced as its last. However, uh, Netflix and the producers of the show are in talks to do another season after that because, it's, well, they just kind of want to, <laughs> basically. I wonder whose choice this was because is this the producer saying, hey, can we do some more or is it Netflix asking for more? Because obviously we knew they were getting a, uh, you know, the the fifth season that was split in two, right? And uh, this this last bit, they were given extra episodes when they when mm-hmm. it was supposed to be I don't know eight, and they were given twelve or whatever it was. They were given extra episodes either way. Um, to wrap up the story, I assume. But maybe was this Netflix going, "Hey, do you want some more?" This people people seem to like this show. It's doing well for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. M- maybe its numbers, its viewing numbers on on Netflix have just been kind of steady, like after the initial period, and it's like they're like, oh, maybe we do want more of this. <laughs> maybe this is actually quite a a well performing show. 
Yeah. Uh, so if you're a fan of Lucifer, this can only be good news, I guess. I mean, unless they wrote like a perfect ending for season five, which they're already shooting. If they're already, I mean, I think they've already shot it even. Like, yeah. So if they wrote a perfect ending and then they're coming back for more after the perfect ending, we might end up with a supernatural situation of like, okay, it kind of ended, but there's more. Here's some more, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Keep in mind, Supernatural did that in season five, had a perfect ending, and is only just ending this year. It's season, what, 16, 15? Something like that. Yeah. 16. <laughs> yeah. So there's actually, a- there's three times as much of the show as the original story now. Yeah, it's always weird to me when shows that um, Sleepy Hollow, if you remember that, from a few years back. Mm-hmm. Um, that, like, it had its ending halfway through the second season. The showrunners left, and they're like, oh, we're like, we're, we're stopping here, we're done. We don't want any more. And then, uh, whatever, no, uh, if anyone's Fox, we're like, no, 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 we want more, get in there. And we got, like, another two seasons after that of just random stuff. That's weird to me just because I'm like, you really, you started a TV show, you did a 13 episode season one, and you didn't, you, you, you kind of went in expecting only to do about 20 to 25 episodes of story and be done. Like, do you on, know? On Fox. Yeah, do you not know how maybe network... Maybe they were like, well, Fox is going to cancel us anyway. Yeah, do you not know how network TV works? Like, you were going to be expected to go follow them. Like, I, I feel like it's weird not to have at least, like, a three, like, you know, season plan or something like that going no, into a network show. And, and then you had, like, the 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 lead actress leave after like the second or third season as well and they still just carried on anyway it was like no one really wants to be involved in this anymore but fox was intent on keeping it alive for as long as they could just refusing to die that's all that was uh so okay so that's lucifer uh continuing regardless uh or possibly it's not it's not a done deal yet but it's the thing uh some casting actually for loki which we mentioned earlier uh this week uh gugu mabatha raw has been added to the show so, I mean, I think she's great. She is pretty great, yeah. Uh, we, we saw her on, of course, uh, Black Mirror, uh, I think, first, and then she's been kind of popping up in all various other things and movies and shows since then. So, yeah, yeah. But uh, her role has been kept secret, so there's not much to tell you yet. It's, yeah. It's all top I mean, secret. Yeah, you know, she, she's a really good actress, so, I mean, it's hard to be annoyed about this. <laughs> yeah, uh so next up some casting for the turner and hooch disney plus tv show the 12 episode series that's been ordered uh josh peck has been cast in the lead so he will be the turner of turner and hooch (laughs) sure did you ever see the movie turner and hooch i did not i'm familiar but i didn't see it yeah i saw it as a kid it was it was was tom hanks and a dog it was you know it's it's what you expect uh (laughs) so it's casting and i think you know this is not necessarily huge news on its own i wanted to kind of put this in here though because i've you know when we get to something else later i've got a bit of a rant about this oh i bet you do and i I knew this was coming i've got a bit of a rant and i just just, just... which which story are you attaching the rant to or is it just the combined uh, there's one in particular I'll attach it to, even though it's actually a movie story that set me over the edge this week, but it's just related to this. So, sure. just, you know, it's coming, it's coming. Uh, so, uh, Turner and Hooch uh, has cast its lead. So, okay, switching back to last week then for the, the new shows and development, we'll do the comedies. Uh, so, Fox has added a pilot order to Pivoting. Damn. See, if this wasn't split over into, like, one show, or, you know, the two two weeks combined, I would have totally made, like, a Friends reference to Segway and to Pivoting. Pivot! Yeah, you, prob- you probably would have done, wouldn't you? Yeah. But unfortunately, because I had to do it on one show, uh, that that became impossible. Oh, well. Uh, Fox has had a pilot order to Pivoting, a half-hour single-camera comedy from writer Liz Astroff and Aaron Kaplan's Capital Entertainment. Rabbi Astroff, Pivoting is a comedy about tragedy set in a small middle-class town in Long Island. It follows three women after the death of their childhood best friend. Faced with the reality that life is short and desperate attempts to find happiness, they make a series of impulsive, ill-advised and self-indulgent decisions, strengthening their bond, proving it's never too late to screw up your life. I feel like the death of a loved one in some capacity is the inciting incident for so many TV shows. <laughs> like... It's and movies. A, it's a very common thing to come, come up with. I mean, okay, and movies, sh- sure, but I feel like with TV shows, though, it, it sticks out to me as being really similar every time because it's usually just the, like the first episode and then it's like forgotten about uh, you know, as it goes on. Yeah. Uh, whereas a movie, like the entire movie will be relevant to that death, you know? Like, yeah, okay, I'm with you. Uh, so, yeah, so that's uh, pivoting. And uh, next up, ABC. 
ABC, has given a pilot order to Work Life, a single camera comedy inspired by the real life partnership of co hosts and longtime friends Kelly Ripa, or Ripa and Ryan Seacrest. Uh, so these are two on screen presenters, and they're going to do a, a comedy about them uh, based around them. Uh, Work Life tells the story of the platonic male female team whose professional success. Personal friendship <laughs> and a balance. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Cara takes a drink if the uh, prof- professional and personal lives are some. You know what? I'm being safe this week because this is uh, going to be a long show. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going with a cheap, low proof, cheaper shit, Heaven Hill, because that'll do. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not bringing out the sixty percenters for this. So yes, ability to share deodorant makes their lives work. Set in the world of real estate, Danny and Scott have taken the leap to start their own team. Now feeling the stress of being the boss, they have to rely on the yin yang of the dynamic more than ever to keep their professional and personal lives afloat. <laughs> Two in one paragraph! Do I have to do it twice? Yes you do! <laughs> God damn it, you Ryan Seacrest. They even said the they even said the exact phrase at the end. Like it was like you got the first version, now you got the exact they phrase. Did. So it doesn't sound like they're actually going to set it around what their actual like job is in real life. It sounds like they're they're going to do a show about this this relationship of this platonic work relationship with their partners, but not do the actual you know TV presenting job. Yeah. So whatever. I can vaguely picture who Ryan Seacrest is. And yeah, I don't know who who the woman is though. I actually can not picture Seacrest. I can picture her though because she was on Hope and Faith, which was a sitcom like fifteen years ago. <laughs> Fair enough. And I remember it being weird because it was Hope and Faith, and her character was Faith, but the actress who played Hope's real name was Faith. <laughs> That's the only thing I remember about that show, and that is the only thing I remember. How hard do you reckon it would be to not? Yeah, you know, I, I I know she's an actress. I know I know this is her job, but. Mm-hmm. How long do you reckon you have to train to not turn around to hearing your name referring to the other character? <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Just because, like, even, you know, if, if I'm at work and someone says my name, even though I know they're not talking to me, they're a random person walking past, I hear my name, I just, you, you look, right? And it's a, you know, a relatively common name, so I, you, you, you get used to it, but... Yeah. Every so often, you just you catch yourself looking, going, oh, and then you go, oh, never mind, not me. What am I doing? Yeah. I imagine you also do that with prick, and maybe, like, bastard, occasionally arsehole. You, you would be surprised at the things I will answer to <laughs> at the workplace. Yeah. Now, I only, I only watched Hope and Faith because I was hoping to see Eliza Dushku, um, because, as you mm-hmm. know, she played Faith on the hit television show, Buffer the Vampire Slayer. You are making me want to take this bottle and smash it over your head. Uh, oh, what a, oh, what a headline for this article. Oh. <clears throat> CBS orders four comedy pilots. <laughs> Don't just take the lid off now. <laughs> <laughs> CBS has made the bulk of its comedy pilot orders uh, Tuesday, as was Tuesday last week, with nods to four projects from established writers and producers. This includes a multi camera mother daughter project from In the Dark creator uh, Kareen Kingsbury and Spider Man Homecoming writers John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein, uh, along with Capital Entertainment. A multi camera Please Hold for Frankie Wolf from Will and Grace creators Max uh, Muchnick and David Cohan, and multi camera siblings comedy The Three of Us from writer Frank Pines. So. I'm about to tell you There's what a all these are. A lot of multi cameras. Yeah, so let's scroll down and get the. Uh... Yeah, so the Kingsbury Daily Goldstein project, which has a put pilot commitment, reunited creative uh, auspices of last season, blah blah. blah. It's a semi autobiographical comedy. It's about a daughter and her mother. Uh, when Penelope's career takes off at exactly the same time as her husband's, they call on Penelope, Penelope's young single mom, Georgia, to help raise their son. Uh, but what they find is that Georgia needs more than raising their kid kid yeah so what? well the fact is that georgia needs more than raising their kid so it sounds like she then becomes you know needy or she needs more from the relationship from them so she oh, becomes okay. this this four it's basically the the parent is, is instead of living with them maybe she is living with them but you know, it's like those premises where okay now the parent's with them again so oh yeah uh she's she's going to be this worded a bit poorly yeah 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 so uh, next up, uh, the Kings. Oh, hold on. 
Oh, that's just more description for that one. Okay, written by Pines. The three of us follows adult siblings who are children of divorce and must circle the wagons when their sister's husband unexpectedly announces he wants to call it quits on their marriage. Fair enough. Uh, and then the oddball comedy Ghosts follows a young couple whose dreams come true when they inherit a beautiful charity home, only to find that it's both falling apart and inherited by a, uh, many of the deceased previous residents. Oh my god. I was like, the start of that, I was like, this is this has got to be haunting. And and you and then it, you started spiraling into something else. I was like, oh, okay. And then, it, and then it actually was haunted. Yeah, it's based on a BBC One show, actually. Is it? Yeah. What was the name of it? Uh, I think it was just Ghosts still. Yeah, same title. Oh. Can't say I'm familiar. But yeah. for some reason, I just thought, I, I assumed it wasn't actually going to to be a, a haunted house. Yeah, so that's the only one that's a single camera. And then the fourth one, Please Hold for Frankie Wolf. Frankie Wolf is an unfiltered, irreverent, powerful businesswoman with no personal life. Aha. Wait, what's the aha? That doesn't count. No there personal is, life. A distinct lack of personal <laughs> life. To still mention that having no personal life is that person's personal life. Nope. No. Nope. Okay. Calling bullshit on that. When Frankie's impossibly fragile and neurotic sister, Tommy, abandons Quincy, an incredible bright inner city child who Tommy attempted to foster, Frankie is fa- there's a lot of names getting thrown around here. Frankie is faced with the choice of taking him in or casting him back out. Can these two lonely damaged people find the love and companionship that has eluded them their whole lives? Probably because it's a TV show. And that's definitely getting a personal life, just for the record. That's, that's what it is. Yeah, no professional, so I'm uh-huh. good. Yeah. All right, so then the comedy's from this week. So we're flipping over to this week now. I can't believe I didn't need any booze during that, that whole article. ABC's uh, given a pilot pickup to Adopted, a single-camera comedy co-written and executive produced by Jimmy Kimmel. And it comes from ABC Studios and Kimmel Lot. Kimmel's production company, obviously. Otherwise, why would you call it Kim a lot? <laughs> it's a good name, though, actually. I don't yeah. know that one. Uh, so, written as produced by Kimmel, the Green Beret's Guide to Surviving the Apocalypse. Oh, sorry. <laughs> written by Kimmel and the Green Beret's Guide to Surviving the Apocalypse creators. <laughs> so that was another show. Whereas the creators <laughs> now are working with Kimmel. Uh, to work on this okay. show. Adopted, because that was the title I told you about, Adopted is inspired by a true story in it when a Green Beret returns home to Texas. So there's a Green Beret in it. <laughs> These people have a thing for Green Berets, apparently. Is it based on the Green Berets guy to survive in the apocalypse? But is, is that like the separate thing this is based on? Or do they just have Green Berets in every story that they do? I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm inclined to think the latter. Uh, in it, when the Green Beret returns home from Texas... To Texas, sorry, from military service, he and his family struggle with the challenges of adopting a new brother, a 12-year-old Russian boy. Okay. Okay. Fair enough, fair enough. It's an interesting idea. Fish out of water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Got that immigrant bent that they, they love doing uh, recently. So They do, don't they? Uh, Alright, next up, ABC again. ABC's given a pilot order to Home Economics, a single-camera family comedy from writers Michael Colton and John Aboud. Um... So, where are we? It's about three adult siblings, uh, one, in, one in the 1%, one middle class, and one barely holding on. It's a simple premise, so I'll give it that. Do you know what I'm getting with all these, you know, the adult siblings mm-hmm. things, and, and, you know, especially with all those, there's all these differences between them. This is us. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, the, that this was not such a common thread before that was such a success. I mean, for dramas, I'll say yes. For comedies, I don't know if it really matters that much because the comedies aren't really going for the same. No, they're not. But I still feel like it was a like we didn't hear it as often before that mm-hmm. was a success. And then you know, okay, they've crept in more and more. Yeah. So uh, there was an update to this actually a couple of days later. Uh, Topher Grace has been cast as one of the leads in it. So there you go, Topher Grace, going to be one of the siblings. Eh, could be worse, I suppose. 
So there you go. Um, that is uh, the comedies for the two weeks. So I will now take this time before we go to the dramas to just uh, tell you about Patreon and get, thank our Patreon producers for the month. So thank you to David Short, Alison M. Fordyce, Cindy Palacios, and Tyler Hess. Uh, thank you to you guys. That means that they are patrons at the twenty dollar tier or above. Uh, but of course, you can support us for as little as one dollar per month and get some bonuses, outtakes, some bonus episodes of some of our, our movie podcasts uh, for that one dollar. Uh, Five dollars, you get early access to some stuff and you get voting rights for certain things. Uh, so go and have a look and see if you're interested and help keep all the content coming. But yes, we'll get into the uh, other shows now, uh, the dramas. So. Again, starting from last week, uh, we'll look at uh, first here. Amazon Studios is acquired to develop a one-hour drama series based on The Dark Corners of the Night, which is an Edgar-winning uh, book from uh, author Meg Gardiner. So, the series features a young FBI agent pursuing other unsubs. That's U-N-S-U-Bs. It's an acronym. Uh, that's short for Unknown Subjects. Why not just... US, well, I guess, I guess it's the country, but I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like to to be fair, if you're saying it, unsub takes like as long as US. True, and actually, probably quicker because you'd have to say US is, whereas it would just be unsubs. Okay, well, I feel like it shouldn't be an acronym. I feel like it should just be the name. Let's just name it unsub. And where does the name come from? Oh, it means unsub you know, uh, unknown subjects. I mean, it's not really an acronym, is it? It's it's no, but it's, ri- it's written like one, though. It's all caps. Uh, um... mm, okay. I would I would accept, like, a capital U and a capital S. Sure. Sure. Uh, but yes, uh, that's short for unknown subjects, the FBI's name for an unknown serial killer. Okay. Uh, but, I mean, aren't all serial killers unknown? And you just give them a name until you catch them? Or, like, uh, maybe this is the ones that don't have enough of a pattern to have a name yet. They haven't got a theme. Okay. Uh, so the first book, uh, Unsub, follows female detective on the trail of an infamous serial killer inspired by the still unsolved Zodiac case. I mean, Zodiac kind of has a name. <laughs> well, I guess that, then maybe Unsub is just mean that yeah. until you catch them, until you have their identity, that they're, they're unsubs, which yeah. I guess it just by definition is any unsolved case, right? Yeah. Who breaks his silence and begins killing again. Okay, so this is purely fictional, this part. <laughs> this is... Yeah. Uh, uh, detect- well, I mean, that we know of. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he switched things up a bit. Yeah, so they don't know it's still the Zodiac doing all these new killings. Uh, detective grew up watching her father destroy himself and his family as he chased the killer and now finds herself confronting the same monster her father failed to catch. Mm. Lot- this reminds me a lot of that time travel one that we had a couple years back. Yeah, T- with, uh, with the radios. Yeah, frequency. Uh, TV shows love to do this thing where the parent had the same profession, and now the kids like going to try and do it. Yeah, it's just not not that common in in real life, is it? Yeah. But it, it happens. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it never. Happens, but it's it's not as I mean, common as they believe. You it, believe. it happens when like the family owns a business. Like let's say you've got a family owned baker, so the, the baker passes it down to his children, so they they become bakers too like that what that feels pretty natural and common or anything where someone owns a business right and then they pass it down to their their, their kids sure. but when it's something like the fbi or something like that where you have to apply and become you know it just like i mean i guess it happened i guess i mean i i do believe it happens but like tv and movies have you i think it happens like, like i think it happens like you say not as much as they say and most more importantly is they don't get assigned to the, the same, same case. case. Yeah, that, that's the part that feels unreal. Because I feel like there's probably a lot of second and third generation people that are, you know, become FBI agents or cops I, I think or whatever. In, like law enforcement and like military. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of people who do who, who maybe do that, but the same cases. That's that's where I start to get a problem. So Tony Collette uh, has been cast in a Netflix series called Pieces of Her, a dramatic thriller based on the 2018 book by best-selling author. Karen Slaughter, and I mean it's probably. It's a a name. I'm sure, we've said this before. Yeah, it's probably a pseudonym, but I hope it's a real name because it's better. I'm, I'm almost certain we've had this exact author. Maybe it was this show. I don't know, but um, I, I remember this conversation distinctly. Of going, yeah, it's a good name. Yeah, it's probably a pseudonym, but it was a very good choice, all the same, and, and that's what matters. Yes. Yes. Um. So. She's been cast in this, Tony Collette. Of course, she was just in uh, 
and unbelievable which uh, got a lot of buzz this is um an eight episode series and it comes from an all-female creative team and executive producers uh leslie linka glatter charlotte stout and uh bruna papandria if i'm saying that right uh so so written by stout who serves a showrunner pieces of heart is set in a sleepy georgia town where a random act of violence sets off an unexpected chain of events for 30 year old Andy Oliver and her mother Laura, played by Colette, desperate for answers, Andy embarks on a dangerous journey across America, drawing her friends uh, the, towards the dark, hidden heart of her family. Okay. A little bit weirdly less interesting as well. Got a bit more generic. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it could be alright, don't be wrong. It just, it just, it, it got more generic as it went on. Mm-hmm. Uh, next up Showtime is given a straight to series order for a one hour drama called First Ladies who is going to star Viola Davis as Michelle Obama uh, so Davis is also going to executive produce the series uh, it sounds like this is going to be a one season thing at least with this character and this you know and with Davis like it feels like it, it might be more of an anthology thing uh, you know that's the, I mean the key thing here is are there any other First Ladies in this description or is this just okay no we're doing Michelle Obama this season and yeah. next season we'll do a different one yeah, no. I think it actually tells us who they're going to focus on for uh, other uh, shows. So, oh, uh, cool. yeah, First Ladies is set in the East Wing of the White House, where many of history's most impactful and world-changing decisions have been made, hidden from view, made by America's charismatic, complex, and dynamic First Ladies. The series will peel back the curtain on personal and political lives. No, Poli- no. <laughs> Political's professional. <laughs> political is just a subgenre of poli- of professional. See, here's here's the problem. Uh-huh. It's not her profession. She's still got a job there, though. She's making not decisions. She's we just said she, they're making decisions. No, she's, she's making decisions in the sense that okay, she's talking to her husband. You know, she doesn't necessarily have a job, an official role. But I will drink anyway. I think it counts. Uh, so with season one focusing on Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt, Betty Ford, and Michelle Obama. So it sounds like season one focuses on these three, and then there'll be another batch. I wonder how we're doing this. Then are we cutting between them across episodes and having thematic links, or are we doing like a couple of episodes on each one? That is a good question, and I have no idea. Because I mean, I can see both angles working potentially. Yeah, they could each get three episodes for a nine-episode season, or it could be something, yeah, where there's like thematic through lines where they're cutting between each one, and we're seeing how a situation in this era is like kind of paralleled in the, the modern era and, with and Michelle And maybe Obama. how they make different decisions, but maybe both are appropriate for what yeah. their context is. There's potential there for that. Yeah. Potential. Uh, next up, uh, John Buffalo Mailer son of the iconic author Norman Mailer is partnering with Hivemind uh, Washington Place Productions and Mailer T- uh, Tuckman Tuck- Media to create a limited series based on his father's novel The Naked and the Dead uh, so this is in development now for a show Hailed as the first novel to come out of World War II the critically acclaimed epic enjoyed 62 consecutive weeks on the New York Times bestseller list uh, The Naked and the Dead was based on Norman Mailer's experiences during World War II the story follows a platoon of marines who are stationed on the Japanese-held island of uh, Anapapai. I'm probably butchering that, but uh, hopefully I got that mostly right. It was adapted into a film in 1958, which was directed by R.L. Walsh, and but the TV adaptation will be an opportunity to put the story on a larger canvas. So, so this is kind of a, a, a World War II memoir, so it'll be a war story, and... So it's a lot about how far TV's come that this is the larger canvas than a movie at that time. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I feel like, I mean, certainly a larger campus for today. I mean, how many people are going back and watching a movie from the 50s now? Not as yeah. many as there should be. But I, I can see this getting the six, eight episode limited series treatment where they give it a lot of money and go for yeah, this heartfelt I, war story. I suspect neither of us will be immediately enthused by it because we're not massively drawn to war stories. There are exceptions, mm-hmm. but inherently it's got you know a barrier to overcome. But I mean, it could be good, for especially for people who are fans of these yep uh next up chris pratt is going to be returning to tv uh he's going to star and executive produce in the terminal list a tv series based on jack carr's best-selling novel uh antoine fuqua and fuqua films banner are going to be producing with writer david uh de Gilio, uh also on board uh so written by de Gilio and directed by fuqua who's going to direct i mean 
is this maybe the whole show or maybe the first episode? It doesn't actually say. If it's yeah. a, I mean, if it's a one season deal, maybe it is the whole show. Uh, Terminal well, List is not unheard of anymore. Yeah, Terminal List is a conspiracy thriller that combines elevated action with deep psychological questions about the cost of pushing our nation's highest trained operators too far. The series will follow Reese after his entire platoon of Navy SEALs is ambushed during a high stakes covert mission. Reese returns home with conflicting memories of the events and questions about his uh, culpability. However, some new evidence comes to light. Reese discovers dark forces working against him. I liked that up until that last sentence. <laughs> what what I was getting was, you know that the uh, the drone operator in Jack Ryan, but mm-hmm. but, but good yes. in my head, obviously meets like homecoming. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I was imagining. I'm like, okay, I'm into this. Well, it still could be that. I f- I feel like. Because homecoming, you could describe dark, that as dark forces. It's just such a vague description that you can't really yeah, place it. Yeah, true. I just it immediately made me less interested just by putting that sentence because I feel like it has some connotations of what they're aiming at. Like I don't know, just just, just dragged it down for me. All right. Uh, so two popular Wattpad stories. Every so often, Wattpad comes up, and I'm like, oh, that, that thing again. It's been a while since I remembered that Wattpad exists. Yeah, Wattpad stories. Uh, Jessica Consolo's She's With Me and H.J. Nelson's The Last She are both being developed for television uh, by Sony Pictures Television. So, yeah, the first look deals with Sony. All right. <laughs> Just say, you know, imagine your job is to, right, okay, t- go and talent scout. And, you know, generally speaking, you'll get, you know, people will mail your books and you read them and go, okay, yes or no. Imagine, you know, being assigned to Wattpad and just be like, right, read through all the shit and find the gold. <laughs> uh, Consolos, She's With Me is one of the most popular stories on Wattpad with more than f- 140 million reads worldwide. Well, 140 million people clicked on it. I mean, how many of them actually read the whole thing is up for debate, I'd say. But uh, the print version of She's With Me uh, from Wattpad Books was released on January 7th. So Wattpad Books, they've got their own publisher to publish That's, that's news stories. to me. Uh, and it debuted uh, in the top 50 of three teen and young adult categories on Amazon. And She's With Me, surviving high school as the new kid is hard enough, but when you're in witness protection, it's literally life or death. Knowing that just one misstep could be her last, Amelia Collins hopes to keep a low profile. That is until she bumps into Aiden Parker, the most infamous guy in school. I have no interest in this whatsoever. So Connor's going to be reviewing the solo. Full 60 minute breakdowns of every episode. Just Connor on his own. That's going to uh, cost you a small fortune. Well, uh, Nelson's The Last She, with more than 12 million reads. That's much less than 140 million. I mean, you're, you're really making this one look bad. What, what this makes me think is, this might be the better quality one. That's why it's been picked, even though it's got less reads. It's one of the most read science fiction stories on Wattpad. Okay. And The Last She. Years ago, a devastating plague wiped out every female on Earth. Except one. So it's why The Last Man, but... The Last She. <laughs> it's X The Last She, yes. Or X The Last Woman. <laughs> what did, what's the title of the show? The Last She. There you go. They, 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 this is pretty unoriginal. Yes. Uh, after three years of surviving alone, I mean, unless it also killed the men. It doesn't say that, though. It just says all the females. Uh, why would it specify if... <laughs> if it would kill them? everyone. You just yeah. say it killed everyone except this one yeah. person. After three years of surviving alone, Ara must leave behind her hidden mountain home and venture into the, the tribal world forged from the collapse of civilization in search of a clue her father promised could spell hope for the human race. Uh, so, if, if this is another young adult story and it doesn't specify it in this description... It could be terrible because I feel like for this, this could be like a really hard hitting, depressing story. Because how dangerous it would be if you're the only woman on the planet with a lot of men who are all in a post apocalyptic world and desperate. And like, you know, I, I imagine that's the appeal of writing that story, right? Yeah, but if it's young adult, then I feel like it's going to be a bit more. Oh, look at all these th- th- these guys I have to choose between. What am I going to do? <laughs> I mean, potentially. Uh, so, yes, two Wattpad stories in development at Sony. Uh, next up, Sid Gentle Films is looking to build uh, on the international smash hit Killing Eve. So, they, they did that, and they're working now on the rights to Watching You, the first installment in the Swedish author Jan Arnold's latest series of detective novels. So, better known by his pen name, uh, Arndal. 
Uh, the Scandinavian writer first published Watching You in 2016, and the novel tells the story of a Stockholm-based detective. Uh, so, not Stockholm Syndrome. Don't don't uh, jump to that conclusion. Just a detective in Stockholm. Uh, Sam Berger and his attempts to find a serial killer following the disappearance of a 15-year-old girl. As the case unravels, it reveals sinister connections with Berger's own life. Because of course it does. Of course, yeah. And then the last story from last week, CBS has ordered two more drama pilots. <laughs> uh, they're called Good Sam, which is from writer Katie uh, Wech, or Wetch, possibly. I'm going with the Scottish pronunciation, but I mean, it could be Wetch. You're probably just projecting that. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, and then the other one's called Out the Door from 24 veteran uh, Evan Katz and Brockheimer Productions. So, Good Sam centers on a talented young, stifled surgeon who embraces her leadership role after her renowned and pompous boss falls into a coma. <laughs> okay, <laughs> go for it. When he awakens sure. and wants to resume surgery, however, it falls to her to supervise his overbearing blowhard, or sorry, supervise this overbearing blowhard who never acknowledged her talents and also happens to be her father. Uh, of course it does. I, I almost feel like you used to have a new drinking rule. Not for every time there's like a, a parent thing, because that's too much, but when they try and reveal it at the end like that, when it's like a twist at the end of the paragraph. Um, who also happens to be. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Who also All happens right. to be. It has to be a new rule. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll accept variations, uh, you know, upon it, as usual, but yeah. that sentiment. Yes. Okay. So that was the, the good Sam one. And then the other, and out the door written by Katz, upon learning that his impending retirement is being pushed off by several years, an LAPD detective who just wants his pension so he can go off and live the good life decides to do everything in his power to get fired. But his bad behaviour only leads to surprising success as solving cases. <laughs> so someone said, can we do the producers but uh, a cop show? <laughs> I can see the appeal of this one. I mean, on CBS, I'm not expect. I mean, I, I could see a good comedy movie out of this. Yeah. Out of yeah. this premise. I could I see some it, you know, fun farce. A, a single case stretched out over 40 minutes will take away all the comedy out of it. Mm hmm But, you know, like I say, the, the premise in general. Yeah, okay. Oh, well, yeah, there's something there, there's something there. So let's switch over to this week's new shows. Now, this first one could be a half-hour show. It's just kind of, they don't say, they don't say it's a comedy. Uh even though it likely might be because of what it's, you know, a, a continuation of. So, Disney Plus is doing a 10-episode season 1 of The Mighty Ducks, which is a continuation of the movie universe. In fact, the additional news that came out a day or two later is that Emilio Estevez is coming back, back as Coach Bombay in this movie. Which is, you know, insane. Before you get into your rant... Uh-huh. Um... Yeah, you, you mentioned that, oh, you're not sure if it's a half-hour show or not. I yeah. mean, it's 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 Disney+, Plus. it probably is, based well, on the Mandalorian. Yeah, even, even Mandalorian's only half an hour, half the time, so... Uh, but, like, so you got Emilio Estevez, I mean, I feel like they have to get Joshua Jackson to play Charlie all grown up, and make him be, like, one of the coaches, because that just makes too much sense, because it just uh, it does, but... Whatever. So, Emilio I mean, Estevez... It's Disney, they can throw as much money at the, as, as they yeah. as he asks for. But they've got Estevez back, right? And... That's all cool. And they've also cast Lauren Graham as one of the lead characters, who's going to play the mother of a kid, and I'll, you know, so here's a, here's a description uh, of the, the thing. So, set in present-day Minnesota, where the Mighty Ducks have evolved from a scrappy underdogs to an ultra-competitive powerhouse youth hockey team. After 12-year-old Evan is unceremoniously cut from the Ducks, he and his mother, uh, Alex, played by Graham, set out to build their own ragtag team of misfits to challenge the cutthroat win at all costs culture of competitive sports. So, this is basically the Mighty Ducks as the villains. So, the Mighty Ducks have become the villains in this. Obviously, it's different kids because it's, you know, 25 years later. And yeah. it's about this new team trying to take them on. Which, I'll, I mean, that's a little bit inspiring, I suppose. Uh, I feel like you have to... I mean, I suppose Bombay could just still be the coach, but I feel like having Charlie be, like, showing up and being a coach would be makes so much sense but whatever anyway so i don't necessarily have a rant on this on its own right if this was just one story whatever fine it's, okay i like mighty ducks growing up i'm morbidly curious at a continuation of some sort but the reason why i, I want to rant is because i saw this story 
like right after the Turner and Hooch story, and then right after the Mighty Duck story, there was an announcement about the new movie that Disney are doing of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, in which Rick Moranis is coming back, which is notable because he retired from acting in like 1997. No one's seen him in a movie in over, you know, 20 years. It's kind of mad. And mm-hmm. all I could feel is like, and I've seen three new stories from Disney in the space of a few hours, and all three of them were, here's this weird thing coming back for a TV show or a movie. And I'm like, they're really becoming guilty of just, like, it just feels like they've got a library of things, and all they're doing now is saying, what can we bring back and make a thing again for the name value? And I know all the studios are doing this to some extent, but I feel like Disney, especially since the announcement of Disney+, Plus, have been especially egregious at this. They have. I wonder if part of it is they have so many recognisable titles in their library now that they that it feels worse from them because they've got so many to, to rely on. It's just, I just, like, I get the... Not that I'm excusing it. I, I get you're going to do reboots, I get you're going to do sequels and whatnot, but I just... When was the last time Disney announced something that was new? Like, there, there wasn't based mm. on a previous thing? I don't know. And the problem is, anytime they do try something, it performs utterly terribly, right? Yeah. Nah, you're and right. Not that I'm saying that's an excuse. Not that I'm saying that, oh, they shouldn't keep trying, because they've got the money to throw away. But... Yeah, you know, if I'm in their position, I get it. You, you try, yeah, you know, every year you're like, here, try this one, and and people go, oh, I'm sick of, re- I'm sick of reboots, I'm sick of all themselves. You're like, here you go, something original. Oh, I don't want that. And uh, I get it. I get why they're just like, fine, screw it, just have your goddamn mighty ducks, <laughs> right? <laughs> and they're just like, I just, whatever. I just, I feel, and you know, someone said to me that like they're doing this because they keep being successful. So my problem is is more with people than it is with the studio. And I'm like, okay, all right, I can accept that. I'm okay blaming people just as much as the studios. I, I'm sorry to blame the studios somewhat, because this kind of goes back to, like, uh, I always use this, this uh, argument with when it comes to technology, is that if it was up to the people, we'd still be in standard definition, because if if, st- if cheaper standard def TVs were still available, I guarantee you more than half of the people on the planet would still be watching an SD because they ju- they're just stubborn and would go for the cheaper option. We have to force them into it by only giving them the better choice, right? And I feel like we have to basically only make, or not only, like, I'm not saying don't make any sequels or reboots, but like we make good things to convince people good things can still be made that are original and essentially force it upon people to convince them that it's possible because your average joke, your normals out there, they're not going to, th- like, stop and think about this and think about the fact that, like, there's nothing original anymore or that, you know, we can't have new things. Like, you have to show them. They're not going to be sitting there going, oh, I really wish there was new things. Most people won't think about it. But when you give them something genuinely new and exciting, and it hits, say, something like John Wick, which actually gains a following and becomes a new thing... Uh, knives out. It, it sticks. People, people attach to it and they get excited. And I feel like Disney are taking this weird... <sighs> lazy way out. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, it just and like and yeah, I mean, and I think it is a problem that they're going to keep doing more Star Wars and Marvel because I think that as much as they are these big things that are kind of almost tailor made at this point to keep churning out more and more branches of the same thing, I wish they would slow down as well. But when when I see like three news stories in a row and it's all movies from the eighties and nineties that you know n- n- we're never really. I mean, Mighty Ducks had three movies, sure. Uh, and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids had three movies, and they were kind of of their time, they had their thing. I mean, hey, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids even had a TV show that I watched on Disney Channel. But once that was done, it was like, well, I mean, that's it. Like, this is not a something that's going to continue. Like, we're, we're done with this now. And I don't even have, have a problem with any one of these things coming back in some capacity. It's kind of weird, but whatever. But the fact that I'm seeing articles about all three of them, and not to mention the fact that they're doing a new Home Alone, they're rebooting that as well. You know, that's been in the news recently. Like, yeah. It's just... Do you know- Hit after hit. Thing, you said, oh, you know, oh yeah, they, they keep churning out Marvel and Star Wars, and, and they do. And so here's the thing. I wouldn't mind. Churn out as much as you want if you were giving me other stuff alongside. Sure, yeah. I mean, my, my, my critique of that has just been fatigued with those things occasionally. Certainly, obviously, more so Marvel and Star Wars. Or more so Star Wars than Marvel, yeah, given my taste. But, like, this rant comes from all of their other articles just being, here's this thing coming back, here's this movie coming back, here's this TV show coming back, it's just all these things coming back, everything's a a revival of something. Yeah, yeah. 
And, and you're right about needing to force people. Do, do you want a, a perfect example? I'm not sure if I told this story or not, but it was a few months ago. Oh, go on. I, I went home to visit my mother for the first time. She usually comes to me. Um, so I went to visit her, and it was the first time I'd been home since since I moved out in like 2013. And she still had the same TV <laughs> that was already fairly old by the time I, you know, it, it, we'd already had it at least five or six years by the time I left. It was it was maybe quote unquote HD ready. Mm -hmm. um, it's a big. It's not even like a flat screen TV. It's a big TV that goes back. A CRT. And, well, no, no, but it's not an old CRT. That's the thing. It was in that weird transition where they just kind of kept the look and it was bulky, but it wasn't like proper CRT technology. So rear screen projection. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's an old, Cause, not cause very I, good TV. Because I had a, my last SD TV was a rear screen because I had a forty two inch rear screen projection TV. And because of the way the technology worked, it was actually kind of tall and just sat on the floor because it actually it was up to a certain height. Uh, right. Uh, and it was really bulky at the back because the way it sort of did it is it sort of like, it kind of projected the image up to the screen from within the th thing. So yeah. It sort of bounced it off the back wall and like, it was a weird thing. It was, it was basically a, a, it was a good technology at the time because it was kind of a cheaper way of getting a bigger screen. Because at the time, 42 inches was considered big. Obviously, times have changed a bit yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. But aye, so you had to force a new TV on her, basically. I was I I walked into the living room and like everything else has changed. New sofas, new yeah. curtains, like you know, I mean the floor was the same, but that was about it. And you know the 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 unit the TV was on was the same. It was quite a nice unit, admittedly. So sure, keep that. Um, but the actual TV being, I was horrified. I was like, Mom, what are you doing? Uh, why, why have you not got a new TV? <laughs> this is going to sound villainous, right? But the truth is, is that. <sighs> This, this is a quote from Men in Black, bizarrely. This was because we, we did Men in Black in uh, the Ace like last year. Uh, like I was shocked at how good this line was. Uh, okay, go on. I can't wait for this. Uh, where Tommy Lee Jones says, a person is smart, but people are dumb. And yeah, there's smart people out there, but people as a whole are dumb. And I think sometimes people just don't know what's good for them and don't know what they want and i feel like when it comes to yeah okay all these things coming back hits those nostalgia cards so they all get excited and you can market it and you can be like hey this thing's coming back and there's some things i care about that i like having come back but the 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 drought because I, I would love to look at the list of everything disney has ordered for disney plus now the honey i shot the kids movie is actually not for disney plus anymore it's just a theatrical movie they're making now okay. um and I, I mean, you probably get a list quite easily. And I don't know if Home Alone's the same thing or if that's got Disney Plus, but um, I would love to look at that list and actually see how many of it, if any, are not something a property they already had uh, that's coming back. There we go. List of original programs distributed by Disney Plus. Have a quick scan. Is there anything on that list at all that isn't oh, wait, a pre-established uh, property? I mean, so far we've had a High School Musical thing, The Mandalorian, and Diary of a Future President, which might be new, admittedly. It may be. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, there's a couple of short series, which I don't know. And if, all the, if all the record... Dark dramas. I have no problem with adaptations. I, I, I would count something that's based on a book or a comic or whatever as a new thing. Because, whatever. Take it for, The source can be fine, whatever. I don't care. Okay, so going through the, the upcoming, we got Falcon and Winter Soldier, WandaVision, Love, Simon, which... Yeah, that's based on a thing. Yeah, that's based on a film from 2018. Monsters at Work, which is the Monsters, Inc., Loki. What If, which is the Marvel thing, uh -huh. Hawkeye. Rogue One TV show, Moon Knight, Miss Marvel, She-Hulk, Big Shot. Uh, oh. oh, no, based on an original idea for Disney+. Plus. <gasps> we got one! We have one! It's a, it's a sports dramedy. We have one. Uh, and then Mighty Ducks, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Turner and Hooch. <laughs> one thing out of what like 15 20 whatever that was one uh, yeah 15 one out of 15 for upcoming original programming now that's not counting any of their non-fiction stuff which, okay so yeah that's different yeah. that's a different thing. and it's not counting short series which sure um but so, that on top of that you also have actual uh continuations of things like the the Lizzie McGuire thing, and you know you got uh, Clone Wars coming back next week, and that's basically under the same category. It's revivals of things in some capacity. Yeah. Oh, there's also a few other things that are in development. 
There is uh, the biggest star in Appleton, which I think is new. Sounds new. I've not heard of it. Um, Explorer Academy, which I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt on that one. Uh -huh. Life and Death, and that's death as in D-E-A-F. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, those sound new, but... Yeah, i got one more, The Night Market. And then we get into Untitled The Sandlot series, Untitled True Lies series, <laughs> Untitled Willow sequel series, Untitled Ice Age series, and Untitled, Untitled Predator series. Predator's a Predator series? How did that not come up in the news at some um, point? Um, so here's the thing. I, I... Even if all those other ones we don't know are all new things, I, f I am fully of the opinion that more than half of any list of like upcoming projects should be originals. Yeah, we got five out of maybe thirty. Once you count in the continuations, and there should be more. There should always be more original things than the the sequels and reboots. Uh, always, uh, it that that should be yeah. the majority, and then there should be a pocket of things that keep coming. Do, do, do you know what this feels like? Yes. This this you know the the amount of like original content on these things, it, it, as in not based on things. It feels like the amount of women in a political cabinet like yeah sure but there's enough there that they go see we've got women here and then you look at it and go yeah there's like five out of 30 of them that doesn't really count yeah in a sense that they can never actually really vote on anything because they're all it's so vastly outnumbered yeah um yeah so i just uh, you know it just it bugged me this week i, I, I got no, all I get it. I got all those, Disney, and people say, oh, there's always been remakes and reboots. Well, there has, but I'll say this again. I've, I've said this before when I brought up this rant. Like, if you look at a time period, say, 1978 to 1985, right? Yes, there were sequels in that time. There was plenty of sequels in that time. But do you know how many of the stuff that we are trying to redo now started and were created originally for the first time in that time period, right? Lots. Alien, Back to the Future, Gremlins, Nightmare on Elm Street, The Terminator... Uh, tons of other ones that I'm not even going to mention right now. Beverly Hills Cop, like, so many things in that, like, seven, eight year period started for the first time. So even though there was a lot of things, you know, a lot of sequels happening, maybe a few remakes here or there, the amount of original material that became iconic, that became this these things that lasted for decades that we still talk about in that time period, I then say to you, in the last seven, eight years, the same rough sort of time span from now, back going back, how many right. things in that time period that have been created new, or made, at least made it to the screen for the first time new, have became a success and started something where you feel like they're going to be talking about them in years? Uh, very few. I think John Wick is the obvious example. Mm -hmm. I suspect Knives Out might get to that stage, weirdly, it's even though it's like, hey, it's Agatha Christie, right? <laughs> it's too early to tell, but we're too close. But it, 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 you know, I admit that we are, yeah. that's what I said, but I suspect it has the feeling of, this could go on for a long time, and it could have that longevity. Well, we'll see, we'll see like, what the buzz is for the sequel and how the sequel does. I think that's when we'll kind of know how... What we'll the, know, yeah. yeah. But it has the potential uh, beyond uh, that. You know, everything's, you know, it's, it's, it's the same comic book movies, you know. And obviously some of the characters are there for the first time, but you know, they're all connected with the same universe, so it doesn't feel like a new thing. It just feels like, you know, mm. another tangent from the same thing. Anyway. And that's not to say there are not good movies or an original movie. Oh, of movies, course there is. But not, in, not necessarily in the blockbuster sphere. No, not, in, not in that way we were talking about them. I, I can do, I, I mean, hell, if I, we're doing top 50, the top 50 series is coming out just now. A lot of those are original movies, but they're not going to be iconic in the same way that all the stuff that they keep bringing back are. I'm not going to see a reboot of Locke in 20 years' time. At least I hope not. <laughs> it's kind of funny as to which of this stuff has been counted as iconic. Oh, we're going to bring that back, right? Because, like, you could show sure, Star Wars, it was around for so long. It was such a thing, right? You, you get why they went, oh, we're going to bring that back. And then you look at, you know, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and you go, sure, those were fun movies, and people liked them well enough, but were people wanting more? It's, it's, do you know what it is? It's because this, the stuff that's coming back, right, is stuff that can appeal to a mass market. Because uh, there is original movies, but the original movies and TV shows... Uh, well, I mean, TV shows don't have quite the same problem. I mean, it's only the problem at Disney+, Plus because that's what started this rant. But the, yeah. the original movies that are happening, which there are still a lot, they're coming in kind of a couple of different flavors. They're coming in indie movies that only, like, film people like, you know, films, you know, not snobs, but like, you know, film buffs, that kind of thing. Um, 
you know, the sort of things that get nominated for Oscars, so your cinephile kind of stuff, uh, highbrow or quirky indie stuff, are the original things for the most part, right? What is drying up in terms of originality that we're seeing here? Obviously mainstream blockbusters, but obviously I think what Honey I Shrunk the Kids and Mighty Ducks are saying mm-hmm. to me is that almost anything that is getting created for kids going forward is going to be some sort of bringing something, which is weird because it's not like the kids know what these things are from the past. Like, this is just... It, no, the, I think th- those are particularly good examples where no no one's creating a movie like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. It, you know, not an original movie of like that no, content yeah. style of like, hey, hey, we'll just pump this out. It's pretty cheap, but it'll appeal to that audience. It's you're getting a lot of it in animation. I wonder if part of it is down to animation being cheaper now and easier. It may be. It may be. I, I miss live action kids movies. I mean, I think Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, from what I remember, does kind of hold up as a fun movie. It's a shame that they aren't making stuff like that and. You know, they're bringing it back, and I just feel like, yeah, movies don't really get made for kids like that anymore. Uh, yeah. Mighty Ducks, not you know, really anymore. Wonder, like, animation at that time was... Okay, 3D animation was kind of coming about. It was early days. It was very expensive, and not many people were doing it. 2D animation took a lot more time and effort, right? And mm-hmm. it was much more expensive. These days, anyone can knock up a 3D animated movie that can look half decent. You know, any studio can just do that without really thinking about it. So I think they're putting all those ideas that they have for these, what were those live action films and just making them animated. It's just a shame. It's a shame that certain types of things just don't get made anymore because of that. So because because of that, I think the mainstream stuff, which is blockbusters, kids' movies and TV shows, I feel like more and more we're seeing them be less original and more just bringing things back or stuff that's connected to established universes like Marvel or Star Wars where uh, it can sort of rely on that brand name. And yeah. ultimately, everything just feels so corporate. And obviously, everything's always been about making money for the shows. It always has been, but... Everything just feels like, like you know, this, this Disney Plus thing just feels like there's like a factory just duplicating things somewhere. And it's just, what what think, else do we have on the list that we can redo? Oh, Mighty Ducks, fine, we'll do that now. <laughs> like, I think the important thing to say is that we're not saying all of this is inherently going to be bad. Some no, of it some, might be quite good. Some of it may be great. And, you know, like, I have no problem with something coming back because someone had a great idea. Like, if someone said, no, I, you know, I had this great idea for a Mighty Ducks story where... Charlie they from the movies to become the villain. Yeah, yeah. You know, Charlie from the mo- the the movies has grown up now, and he's like coaching the team. But he's different from Bimbi, and it has this heart to it, and it has this this message that you know that the writer wants to tell. Like, does, does it not remind you a lot of that YouTube Karate Kid show? Yeah, yeah, I guess. Um, but I feel like the problem is, is that I don't buy for a second that ninety nine percent of these Disney Plus things or just Disney in general right now. Or because someone had an idea. Almost all of them are like, no, we want to have a new Mighty Ducks thing, find someone to write it, and come up with something. Uh, yeah, almost certainly. Yeah, you know, we, we want a, a, a remake of this live action or like, this anime I hope movie. That they, okay, we'll get through the first year or so, and they'll, you know, they, they're just giving us all these brands to get people on board, and maybe after that, people can come in and pitch things, and they'll be more open to. Original. Yeah, maybe. I could be wrong. Don't be wrong. I, I, I'm being hopeful there. I'm not saying I necessarily the, expect that. The way mainstream movies have been going, though, I, I'm not particularly hopeful because that's just no, been no, getting no. worse every year. We're we're at a point yeah. now where almost none of my top ten for the last few years have been any like mainstream, you know, blockbustery type movies. Like it's it's been almost none. I often have one or two just because I enjoyed them, but it's few and far between. Like usually, um... yeah. But if you go back to like the early two thousand, or certainly the nineties and eighties, like a lot of my top tens will be the blockbusters because I think they're genuinely really good and they're mixed in with some of the more arty stuff. But these oh, yeah. days, it's like no, no, it's ten like arty movies <laughs> because the the blockbusters just are are weak. You know, barry maybe one or two that kind of sneak on there a little bit. But yeah, I get it. I will say, uh, just off the top of my head, it feels like HBO Max isn't quite as bad as at this no, even though they have yeah. a lot of properties and they, they have definitely got things that i mean we just talked about the friends thing earlier on um it doesn't feel like they're doing the as ra- many the ratio seems better just so far in terms of what they're developing i mean what actually ends up going to series is another question but it does feel like the, the ratio is a little bit better uh so that's good um because because this is the, especially with disney they've got the money to do all of this that will make them bank and then make as many other stupid things that'll fail as they kind of want to, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So, now, run it over. We can get back to the, the news. Oh, God, there's more news, isn't there? <laughs> so, 
Yeah, uh, so that was uh, Mighty Ducks, which, you know, I was a big fan of those movies growing up. Um, and I've never tried playing ice hockey. I've, I've never actually even been skating. I've never worn ice skates before. Have you not? No. So Have you been in an ice rink before? Just not been on the ice, maybe? Um, well, where, where, where I used to go swimming, like there was like an ice rink in the same building that I walked past, but I mean, I was, I was never on it. Okay. If that makes it. Fair I've, enough. I've seen an ice rink, <laughs> if that makes yeah, it. Well, you're yeah, asking well, me. You've been like around, you know, around the edges, you know, this, 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 you know, watched people skating, I don't know. I've seen people skating, yes. <laughs> sure, okay. I've, I've seen the, the art of skating. I understand the concept of it. I'm not. <laughs> sure, yeah, okay. It's, still, it's never something I did. I, I think it was a. Uh, I think it was more about parents more than anything else. Uh, my father was in a wheelchair, so he obviously wasn't doing that stuff with me. And I think my mother was terrified of skating. So <laughs> I feel like you could take a wheelchair on the ice. Well, you probably could, but with the other parents scared of ice. Uh, yeah, that's a problem, admittedly. Yeah, you know. Uh, so it was just not, never something I did as a kid. Uh, um, it's I, kind of funny. I, I love the sport, ice hockey. I love watching it. It's such a great, fun sport to watch. Um, not as much as Matt, don't get me wrong, but yeah, I, I love my I love my team, um, but I hate actually ice skating. Yeah, watching actual ice hockey is boring as shit for me. But watching a movie version of it where they can actually do like actual editing and cutting, you know, and shots, it's quite exciting. Especially because Mighty Ducks. This is the thing. Mighty Ducks has a phenomenal score. This is the thing people don't realize is the music in Mighty Ducks is really goddamn good. Yeah, yeah, it is. So. Uh, it's, it's it's kind of funny though that ice hockey is one of those it's one of those few sports that there's action every like two seconds it's so fast and frantic that you know you know in a lot of sports movies and things like that they'll have to right let's cut away from all the boring bits right mm. and get to the good stuff ice hockey is like 95 percent good stuff because it's that fast paced <laughs> so anyway let's move on i've got a few more news stories uh so coming up we got uh the the resort it's a dark comedy series uh so i'm assuming this is not a half hour show though just based on the who's involved and dark comedy doesn't tend to be sitcom style uh so this is from andy Sierra, the writer uh, of sundance breakout pam springs and has been produced by sam esmail's esmail corp so we have some uh some credibility there even though esmail himself doesn't isn't working on the show uh, and this is under their deal with UCP, that's Universal Cable Productions. So it'll lately end up on USA. I mean, I'll read the description, but I mean, it could end up in sci fi potentially, but if it's not science fiction, it probably won't. Uh, the resort explores the love and the weird things we do in the name of it, encased in the elaborate true crime conspiracy, with each season set in a unique perspective. Or sorry, with each season set in a unique, picturesque vacation destination. This first season takes place in an all inclusive resort along the Mayan Riviera, with a married couple on the brink of divorce, inadvertently becoming embroiled in one of the uh, Yucatan's most bizarre unsolved mysteries, but somehow is part metaphysical detective story, part Indiana Jones-esque adventure, and part coming-of-age romance. Um, okay. I think I'm interested. I'm curious. Even just to see how this concoction works. And what's interesting is it sounds semi-anthology-esque. Uh, sound like yeah each season will be a different case different location different cast i assume that's what it sounds like so i'm definitely intrigued just by how weird this sounds it's got a bunch of different things going on in it so yeah uh yeah i mean that's how you get us interested you give us a description like that and i mean having esmiel corp attached to it does also give it a little hint of like oh if esmiel's like sort of putting his name in this and saying hey this is something i believe in it gives us a little bit more moment for pause it does yeah so now yeah, that's the resort which is now in development uh so cool uh next up uh the creator of don't trust the bee in apartment 23 uh, i mean we could say just don't trust the bitch in apartment 23 we'll have to censor that but the the tv show had to censor its name though which was the funny part about it yeah uh so uh, the creator of that uh Nanachka Khan, if I'm saying that right, I apologize if I'm not, uh, and Kristen Ritter have reunited. She's going to produce and star in it. Uh, I guess Jessica Jones is done, so she's got a bit of free time to do other shows. Uh, the Untailed mm-hmm. series, in which Khan and Ritter have partnered uh, with rising writer Angela Limana, who worked on The Punisher, uh, is a dark comedy about a female serial killer, played by Ritter. Honestly, horror as a female serial killer makes a lot of sense. I can I, see I, it. I, 
Yeah. Uh, that the, hooked me up. The project from Universal Television, uh, where Kansas under an overall deal, is sparked a bidding war. Uh, and apparently Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, FX, and HBO Max are all bidding on it. They're all interested. So so this could be anywhere. <laughs> all, all good homes. They, they, they all have the potential to make good shows. Right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, I mean, now we've had some HBO Max yet, but I mean, it's technically HBO. We're just assuming that yeah. they'll have at least a borderline HBO level of standards and budget. <laughs> yeah, so that is really cool. Yeah. So it's based on the upcoming book Serial Killer Anonymous by Charles Waradi. So, I'm kind of interested. Uh, Ritter as a serial killer, I think, could be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, are we getting Dexter vibes from this? Not necessarily in quality, just in tone, maybe, I'm thinking. Mm, could be. Yeah, just thinking. I can see her pulling that off. Uh, speaking of HBO Max, they're developing a show uh, from Adam Silvera's best-selling young adult novel, More Happy Than Not. A one-hour series from Drew Commons Creative Engine Entertainment and E1. And more happy than not, uh, it's a sweltering, dangerous summer in the Bronx. 16-year-old Aaron Soto is struggling to find happiness since his father's suicide, but he's gunning for it. With the help of his girlfriend Genevieve and his overworked mom, he's slowly remembering what it may feel like. But grief and the scar on his wrist keep and the scar on his wrist keep him from forgetting the past completely. When Genevieve leaves for a couple of weeks, Aaron spends all of his time hanging out with this new guy, Thomas. Aaron's crew notices, and they're not exactly thrilled. Since Aaron can't stay away from Thomas or turn off his feelings for him, he turns into uh, the Latio Institute. Or maybe that's... Yeah, Latio. I'll say Latio. Uh, that's L-E-T-E-O. So, uh, revolutionary memory alteration procedure to straighten himself out, even if it means forgetting who he truly is. So that sounds slightly science fiction and that it might be like playing with his memory uh a little bit when it gets going um it's young adult though and honestly the, the, you know um, yeah him I'm, having I'm, a, I'm, him having a crew <laughs> like that that sentence there's like oh okay sure sure but you, you know he mentioned he had feelings for the other guy right so i'm assuming mm -hmm. this is kind of like essentially playing on gay conversion therapy is what the the, the point is supposed to be yeah the twist might be that he's already been converted and doesn't know it yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. You know, the, like, that's, that's the whole thing. He's, he's going to find out that he he was converted uh, in secret and his memories were erased. And this is this going to be Why him. would you know, right? I, yeah. I can see this being like, you know, he's done all this before. And, you know, just he remembers it differently. So, that you know, and now he's going through it again. Yeah. So, you know, there's maybe some potential there. Uh, so, and then finally, we got a show from Fox here. They've given a pilot order to an untitled drama about students remaking the 1985 movie, The Goonies. What were you saying earlier, Pete? Well, this is an interesting one, because this is not a, a a reboot or a continuation of The Goonies. This is about a group of people trying to remake it. This is... <laughs> so Yeah, but... Do you know what the problem is? Uh huh. You could do this. Ignore, remove the name The Goonies, right? Mm -hmm. And just read the description as students trying to remake a beloved film from their childhood. That's what this could have been. They've used The Goonies because they can and it'll get people interested. That's the cynical part. I mean, yeah, I don't mind that as much, though. I mean, this is the sort of thing where, like, th this on its own could be a good idea, right? And. It's like, well, why not just use a real thing? If you've got access to a real thing that, that it fits sure. with, then why not use it? And there's a cynical side where, okay, maybe this is the only reason why it's getting made, but, like, at least there's an idea here that's different than just this try and continue it. So here's the thing. No, so no, that's true. The entitled uh, film reenactment drama stars uh, stems from the dire direct talent script deal Fox Entertainment signed with, uh, with Watson. That's Sarah Watson, who's the bull type career. Uh, and other writers earlier this season. Watson was paired with Berman and her Fox-owned uh, production company Sidecar to develop a concept. So, where's the, uh, where's the description here? So, any on the project written by Watson after failing to make it to New York and carrying a heavy secret with her, Stella Cooper returns to her distressed automotive hometown uh, to substitute teach. She finds inspiration, hope, and ultimately salvation when she agrees to help three students who are pursuing their filmmaking dreams by putting on an impossibly ambitious shot-for-shot -shot remake of one of the students' favourite movies, The Goonies. 
Over the course of the season, their passion will inspire a town of desperate need and hope and love to uh, in this love letter to a power of cinema to the power of cinema storytelling and dreams. So what I like about this idea is if this really becomes about kind of like celebrating the love of cinema and it just uses one movie to kind of do that. Yeah, it'll justify using a real movie because it'll make it, it all work around it. Um, and the good news is a, is a beloved movie. It's got its naysayers, but it is, yeah. a, a generation of people grew up in that and love it. So, I, I you know, if, if this has the right beats, I mean, it's on Fox, so I mean, I'm not necessarily assuming quality here. But in theory. But if in theory, if this can do like what Hugo did for me about celebrating like the dawn of cinema or what Cinema Paradiso did for me and celebrating the love of cinema and like how it kind of, you know, informs your life and uh like the friendships you have around it like if, th- if this can hit some of those beats and be about and this could be something special where it's like more from my generation i wasn't born when the movie came out but you know i grew up with this movie whereas the movies that those movies were referencing were way before my time and i, I kind of learned about those yeah. movies through those um so there's potential you know what there's potential with this there is there is um i do want to just rewind slightly and feel like we should give Disney Plus credit for one additional thing we lumped in. If we're if we're using the rule of, well, it's not actually just a remake or a reboot, sure. uh, we do have to give them a touch of leeway on the, uh, the high school musical thing, because that whole thing was about a school trying to recreate the musical. Sure. It was a little bit different. So it was it was like the theoretically the 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 school where that musical was filmed, you know, and, and you know, the students trying to put on. I'll tell you this. I'd give them more credit if they didn't put High School Musical in the name. If this show has Goonies yeah. in the name, you can deduct a point from it. That's fair. Yeah. Right? I don't think it should have Goonies in the name. Um, that, I mean, that said, though, I, I can see, like, a version of this where you call Because one of the things that they say in the movie is that Goonies never say die. Like, I can totally see that by the title of the show and it kind of making sense. Because it's about yeah. the determination to get it done. So I... <sighs> But you know what I mean, like because because that because that show was literally just called High School Musical. It was like high, no, it had a really convoluted title. Let me let me find it. Yeah, it but it was like as High School Musical, the musical, the series. Yeah, so I mean, like if if this is called The Goonies, like the the reboot or something like that, like yeah, you know, I'll, I'll deduct a point from it because because they are just relying on the name but theoretically this could just have a, a title that's completely separate it just happens to be about kids trying to recreate the goonies no no i i agree yeah but i, I thought we should probably give the, the high school musical one at least half pass on the same sure, kind of logic sure sure i know that's what the premise was i'd forgotten yeah. uh but that is i uh, remember just because it was so weird but that was the last story uh we are done with the news finally uh 90 minute episode give or take yeah at least 15 minutes so that was you ranting it was but hey you know it's fine maybe i'll be a bonus but maybe i'll maybe i'll trim it out and put it on the patrons uh so that has been almost cancelled tv news and it's been a long episode so i'm just going to wrap up as quickly as i humanly can uh so thank you very much for watching or listening get us on the twitters at mailed underscore fuzz for channel updates if you want to support the show leave us comments like ding the bell for notifications rate the audio podcast on apple podcast give us five stars support us on patreon for as little as a dollar do all those things or any of them or pick and mix whatever you want to do uh but otherwise that is us check out the tv reviews that are coming up obviously we tried lock and key last week we weren't really into it but the first episode review is there if you want to check that out uh coming up next week we do have the amazon show hunters we'll be checking that out for sure and um, we'll see if we want to keep it but we'll definitely be looking at episode one uh, we finally got lost in space coming back out again episode seven's review just went out so we'll try and keep that coming at least once per week so that it's uh getting wrapped up in the, the near future if not a bit quicker so look for for those things and obviously Picard's still ongoing, uh, The Outsider's still ongoing, so we're going to have a look at those. But that is us, so thank you once again for watching or listening. We always appreciate it. Keep watching TV, guys. Have you got any vanilla?